Hello, everybody. We're in the second session of this room. Um, can you welcome Evan Brumley to the stage and give him a big round of applause to talk to us about trains? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Evan Brumley, um, at Evan Brumley on Twitter. I'm a senior solutions architect with WSB Digital in Melbourne. Um, WSB has been heavily involved in the Melbourne Metro Tunnel Project. Um, the Melbourne Metro Tunnel Project uh, is a new nine kilometre twin tunnel underneath the Melbourne Central Business District. Uh, it encompasses five new stations. It's an $11 billion project. Um, started in 2018 and scheduled for completion 2025. This is the route of the new tunnel. Um, so you can see we've got our five stations, North Melbourne, Parkville, State Library, Town Hall and Anzac. Um, those are currently five giant construction pits. Um, and there's also another two construction pits at the entrances to each of the tunnels. So seven large construction sites in total. I'm contractually obliged to show you three of our shiny station renders. Uh, this, is the, um, this is the new uh, North Melbourne station, this is the new Parkville station, and this is the new State Library station. I'm also contractually obliged to show three photos of people in high hats looking at things. <laughs> so here are them. Um, and fi one final one, this is Meg the Tunnel Boring Machine, named after the current captain of the Australian women's cricket team. So, Melbourne Metro Project had a, had a problem. And here is the problem, or one of our problems. Um, this is the Parkville Precinct. It can be a little hard to read the white text, but we have the University of Melbourne, the, Gra um, the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre, Peter Doherty Institute, the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And in these buildings, we have radiotherapy machines in the Comprehensive Cancer Centre. These are the big, hulking, multi-ton um, radiotherapy treatment machines, linear accelerators that are um, treating patients with millimetre precision. Uh, electron microscopes in the Peter Doherty Viral Research Institute, some of the most uh, sensitive, expensive electron microscopes in Australia. Um, animal laboratories in the Melbourne, in University of Melbourne's uh, medical building. Um, rats, mice, um, fish, exotic fish. They've been doing a longitudinal study of fish for 20 years. Um, and those fish apparently don't like being um, shaken or loud noises. Um, there are medical classrooms. That building was built in the 70s. Their idea of ventilation was to have an air gap at the bottom of every window. Um, so when you have a construction site next door, that can be unpleasant. Um, there are operating theatres and you know, patient bedrooms and so on um, in the Robham Hospital. Uh, we have engineering workshops with wave pools and uh, flow chambers and that sort of thing, all sorts of sensitive equipment. And finally, we have um, a... <laughs> The Melbourne University Law School, which, which is completely filled with lawyers. Um, so, what's our problem? The problem is that this is the construction site. Um, the construction site, uh, as of uh, last month, looks like this. Um, this is actually looking a bit cleaner than it was. We've just finished piling, um, so it's, it's looking a little bit neater, but yeah, it's, it's a mess. Um, so, we have to handle some pretty sensitive locations and the environmental reporting requirements are really, really strict. So, we have this document. This is the environmental management framework. You can access it at the link, which you can't see because my slides are cut off. But um, if you Google search for Metro Tunnel Environmental Management Framework, you will, you will find it. Um, it's a fairly lengthy document. I think it's about 89 pages. Um, it contains really useful information like what we're supposed to do for monitoring, reporting, how we can get audited. And most importantly, it has this, our environmental performance requirements. Um, if you look at the page numbers carefully, you'll see they go 27, 27, 27, 28, 89. Um, and that's because of table seven. Um, table seven is the list of environmental reporting requirements, 59 pages long, 132 categorized labeled requirements. Um, many of these requirements are fairly procedural things, so there'll be things like, you know, you must have this particular paperwork, you should have this plan in place, you should consult before you, look at the, before you talk about damaging these trees. But a really good number of them are actually quite quantitative. Um, they rely on sensor data, like they, you, you should have sensors in these places, you should be monitoring these requirements. Um, and they're not as simple as just saying, well, you know, your decibel level from this sensor can't go above this line. It's, we want you to put a sensor in, in this animal laboratory and then um, take the readings from that and then calculate what a fish would hear. Um, and, and then do a few more things um, and, and then you, know, you need to report those levels back to the University of Melbourne in real time um, so that if something happens then they can go and soothe their fish. Um, 
more importantly, they also have a rat, um, uh, a, a rat experiments going on. And apparently, rats eat each other um, if, if you shake them or, or expose them to loud noises. So it's, it's pretty important. Um, and there's also you know, the linear accelerators and so on actually treating patients. And if we put them out of alignment, then people die. But um, yeah, the fish are important as well. Um, so there's a question. How do we keep track of all the requirements when the project is the size of a city? That's just one of the sites. There are seven sites. Um, and they're all, um, they all have problems in their own um, unique ways. The classical approach, which is engineering projects have been doing for a long time. You go and buy or rent some sensors. Um, usually about $20,000 per sensor, um, if you're getting the ones that you can be audited on. Um, you send graduate engineers to install them on site. They, they come in a briefcase. They send the gradies out with a briefcase, and they set them up, and then usually sit with them for a night so they don't get stolen, um, take some readings, and then, um, and then bring them back to the office. Um, you collect your CSV files directly from the sensors. If you're really lucky, they might have an FTP server built in. Uh, usually, you'll just have an RS-232 cable that you talk to. Um, you take those back to the office, you analyze in Excel at your leisure, you do your calculations, usually have a, a big acoustics team, um, and then you file reports at the end of the month to say, you know, we, we shook the fish 10 times this month. Um, maybe go check on them um, if, it's, <laughs> if it's not too late. Um, the modern approach, which, which more companies use these days, is you go and acquire sensors from a vendor, capital V vendor. They have a SaaS platform. Um, and they say, yes, you buy, us, buy your sensors from us. They will have SIM cards built in. Um, and they will send data back directly to our SaaS platform. Um, and they say, OK, log into our SaaS platform, set up your alerts. Um, we, we can do a bunch of, bunch of analysis. Um, and then you go to them and say, yeah, we need to find out what a fish could hear. Um, and the SaaS guys and the vendor says, well, that's not really in our business plan. Um, it's going to take quite a bit of development time to make that work. Um, and then you go to the vendor and say, we've also got sensors from like these other three companies that we inherited from another project. Um, can you integrate those? And they just say no. Um, so these processes, these weren't going to work. So we had to come up with a plan. Uh, and the plan was to build a new platform. Um, this is the, the project badge. This is on my laptop. Um, then we've got our noise cat, our vibration cat, and our air, air quality cat. Um, the MLM stands for Melbourne, Melbourne Livability Monitor, which was the original name for the project. It's since changed to the Melbourne Tunnel Environmental Monitor because we had to have Metro Tunnel in the name. Um, the requirements of this were we needed to accept data from any device at all, uh, focus on noise, vibration, and air quality. Um, some of those devices were going to talk to us directly. Um, many others were going to come actually via the vendor SaaS platforms. We were still going to use those vendor SaaS platforms because they do a lot of really good work in terms of actually talking directly to the devices. Um, if you're ever working on an IoT um, project, try not to work with devices directly if you possibly can. Um, so they were doing all the horrible um, you know, connectivity stuff and going out and fixing devices if they, went, if they broke. Um, and mostly we're talking via vendor platforms. Um, so. We had to accept that telemetry. We had to validate and store it. Um, we have an estimated peak load of about a billion records per month. Um, we don't actually have all that many sensors. Like in the scheme of things, we're talking about 150 to 200 sensors. Um, but these sensors are often sending up records at a half second frequency. Um, so it all adds up. Um, losing data is a really big deal because, as I mentioned before, we can get audited. Um, so if, the, um, if, if, a, you know, if, if we shake the fish, um, or if something goes wrong, like say we've got um, in other sites, we have apartment blocks, um, and there are contractual arrangements there so that you know, if we have noise events on a certain number of days within a six month period, then we have to relocate everyone in that apartment block. So there is real money uh, at stake. Um, and we have to have that record um, of, of every piece of telemetry that comes through. And if we miss stuff, it's a big deal. We have to analyze and process that telemetry. As I said before, the environmental requirements don't map directly onto sensor data points. So we have to have some sort of um, calculation engine to make that work. The calculations are also complex, and they're liable to change. Um, they often come up with baseline readings at the start of the project, and those baselines are incorrect. Um, the, the calculations might not be quite right. Um, that environmental performance thing, uh, uh, register, the environmental um, guidelines document has been updated several times with new, new calculations. So we have to have an engine where we can handle that easily and also retrospectively. Um, they, also, they also need to happen in real time um, because you know, we want to be able to send well, near real time. We're not working at sub-second accuracy. We're talking sort of minutes. Like you know, we want to know roughly when something happens. 
we have to provide access to that data. So that should be available firstly to our environmental teams so they can see if anything's going wrong and report to the site supervisors. Um, but our external data stakeholders also need access. Um, like the University of Melbourne and the, the Comprehensive Cancer Centre, they wouldn't actually let us start work until they had access to these sensors in near real time so that they could verify for themselves um, that we weren't causing any problems. Lastly, we need to send alerts. So at the very least, we need to send someone an email whenever an EPR or environmental performance requirement is breached. Um, and those reports that we're sending at the end of the month, they still need to go out. So we need to be generating PDFs um, with all of that telemetry included. Um, every alert that happens in our system, so every time that we've gone over the, one of the magic lines, we need to document that. And a team member from the environmental team needs to actually go in and say, uh, yeah, okay, we, we figured out what this was, um, so a bird landed on the microphone, or no, we weren't working at this time, or actually, yeah, this was a planned exceedance, we had prior arrangements with the stakeholders, etc. The time frame for building this was four months to the full first release. Um, so this started, uh, we had our first kickoff meeting uh, at the very end of 2017, uh, and our first release was in um, uh, sort of April, May uh, of 2018. Uh, that was a hard deadline. As we said, the various stakeholders wouldn't actually let us begin certain works until we had access to sensor data. After that four month build, we had six more months uh, to reach feature complete, uh, which is sort of having all the reporting requirements, every sensor online, that sort of thing. The team, this was actually a really unique team. Um, so this was a joint development between WSP and Arup, who are two um, pretty, uh, pretty strong competitors. Um, we both do very similar work, um, but in the way, in, in the engineering world, it's actually pretty common for competitors to be working together. Projects like the Melbourne Metro Tunnel are, are way bigger than any one organisation. So you end up with contractual arrangements where you have one, two, three, four, in this case I think there's something six or seven different engineering companies all working on the one project together. And they're all, the contracts are actually quite strict in terms of um, how much manpower you can, you, each team can uh, allocate to a project. And this was no different. So this was mandated that there will be a 50% split in development hours uh, between two companies. So we actually had to merge two development teams to make this work. Overall, there were probably two, two to three developers and one project manager at any one time, but the, pro the team was fairly fluid and we had people swapping in and out. Um, the other interesting thing about this was that it was fully self-contained. So because it was a joint development and the code we were writing actually wouldn't belong in the end to either of our organizations, all of our infrastructure, all of our code had to be basically built from scratch, um, setting up our own Bitbucket accounts, um, setting up our own, our own Jira accounts, um, our own AWS accounts, everything. Um, there are references to CYP Digital all the way through because CYP was the name of the consortium that we were building it for. Um, so it was almost felt like starting a startup at the very start. You know, we were sitting there with the corporate credit card, making accounts on every services, you know, from one password through to to Atlassian. So that gets me to the build. So what did we actually end up building and how did we structure it? So what I'm going to go through is a bit of the architecture that we came up with. Um, I don't have enough time to go into a really deep dive because there are lots of components, but I just want to pick out a few of the, the, the interesting parts um, and the parts where we were using different parts of, of the Python uh, ecosystem to make a fairly ambitious project actually possible. So starting off. Devices in the field, um, just a few, like a couple, a couple, few, few sensors picked at random. Um, we had to write basically device agent. So we're talking sort of microservices here. Um, the contract for a device agent is it must grab data from a device, either directly or indirectly, or receive data from a device, and then forward it across into our into our platform. So these are fairly self-contained ones. I'll talk about these in detail a little bit later. Um, but we have a few different types. So you can see here I've got API polling ones and FTP service. I'll describe those in a bit. Those send data into a data pipeline. So we're using AWS Kinesis. Um, what this gives us is a 48-hour buffer. So for those who don't know AWS Kinesis, um, it's essentially a pipeline. It has multiple, multiple things can push data in. Multiple subscribers can pull data out. Um, and it keeps a record for the last 48 hours. And it's hugely scalable. Um, so if you want to have, you, want, you can have shards that are you know, hundreds of shards and it's completely managed. So like managed infrastructure was kind of a big deal for us because we didn't have a lot of time and we didn't have much trust in our own code. Um, so for things where the audit 
process was like anything in this data pipeline where uh, we could be audited later on, we're like, yes, please, let's use managed services as much as we can. If we were going the full open source route, then we could use something like, a, um, uh, like Kafka uh, would we'll do the same job. First stop after that data pipeline is um, auditing. So we have our audit markup, which is a tiny, tiny script. Again, we don't want to inject much of our code into this process because um, code is scary and full of bugs. Um, so what this audit markup thing does is basically take the data that the, that the agents have sent, so all that device data coming through, and just adds a little bit of information, basically wraps it up in a JSON blob, um, gives a timestamp of when it saw that piece of data, maybe extracts a couple of fields so that later on we can do a little bit of analysis on our, on our um, auditing pool, um, because after that it basically forwards it straight into AWS S3. Uh, it uses um, uh, uh, Kinesis Firehose um, to do that. Um, so we have this sort of, now we've now got this pipeline where we've got telemetry coming in from our agents, going through our pipeline, through a tiny little audit markup script, which is uh, deployed in AWS Lambda, and then straight into S3. Um, so that is our safety net, basically. The next step is we have uh, streaming analytics. I'll go into this in a little bit more detail. Streaming analytics is probably the one area where we couldn't use Python, or we didn't use Python. We probably could have. Um, I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, that streaming analytics cluster then dumps all that information into a time series database. Um, we're using InfluxDB, um, and InfluxDB has been wonderful. We, like, for, the, for the workloads we're experiencing, which is about 10% of that 1 billion so far, um, we're running it on a T2 micro instance. Um, and because we have our data pipeline buffer, we've got our auditing system, we have our streaming analytics cluster, which is capable of, of having holds on data sending, we don't even have to have that on a particularly high availability. Um, so that, that, that's really, it's been a really good choice. Um, and finally, uh, we have the analysis um, and basically the core, core of the system, which is a big monolithic Django app. Um, we've got web application, API, workers, et cetera, user interfaces, uh, user interfaces done in React. Um, and um, yeah, that, um, that's really where most of the action happens. One thing that's really, um, really important is that from steps one, two, three, and four here, there is actually a hard gap between steps one through four and then five. So our core platform has a read-only access to that time series database. Um, and we want to keep it that way because then we can work freely on this Django app uh, without ever having to worry about losing important, valuable data that we can be brought, that can be brought up in court later on. So a little bit of information about each of our um, components. Um, back on that device, that, on that, col that first column with our device agents, um, we have what we call API pollers. So those vendor SaaS platforms usually provide some sort of REST API. Um, and so we're writing some straightforward Python scripts to pull that vendor API, um, pull data in, um, and send into our system. Those vendor APIs aren't always what you'd hope for. Um, so for instance, we have vendors who have given us, say we have 100 devices on their platform. Uh, each of those devices puts up three telemetry streams. They're like, here's 300 endpoints for you to pull. Um, so that can be a bit of a challenge writing Python scripts. Um, we've, we've done it the simple way to start with. Um, and um, we actually deploy the scripts into Elastic Beanstalk, which is usually used for web applications, but actually does a really good job if you're in a hurry. Um, you can use, if you're using their Docker environments, um, then it provides a really easy, well-trodden path for deploying scripts and having them um, at, least a, at least a basic amount of monitoring and being able to, to strike your environment, bring it up again really quickly. Um, the um, simple state, uh, we have most of these API polls need a bit of state, so they need to be able to say, um, okay, this device, this telemetry stream, the last timestamp we saw was this, so then if they crash or they go down, um, they can start again from when they left off. We use AWS DynamoDB for that, just a simple key value store, saying this device, this timestamp. Um, as I mentioned before, we have to poll a lot of endpoints, so they're heavily multi-threaded. Um, this will be a really good candidate for async IO and AIO HTTP at some point um, so that we don't have to have ridiculous numbers of threads. If we end up with a thousand threads polling, then um, you know, besides the fact that we're kind of DDoSing our SaaS, our SaaS vendor, um, we're also using up way too much RAM. So um, yeah. Um, we've also got FTP servers, and this is actually one area which I think that Web Python really helped us out, um, is PyFTBDLib. Um, 
I don't know how many people have had that your chance to look at this, but it's a really, really nice FTP server. The traditional way of doing a device agent like this is you bring up a Linux server, um, install, you, know, you do your app get install, FTP, whatever, um, and then you have FTP server dumping files into a location um, and a polling script that's looking at those files and pulling them out. But we wanted to do something a little bit more modern. Um, so we actually wrote a, we use PyFTB Dlib to write our own server. Um, and that server has um, instant processing of incoming files via a thing called event callbacks. They look a bit like this. Um, so you can write your FTP handler, register that with your server, and then all you need to do is write a little function called on file received, and whenever a file is received, you can do something with it. So in this case, uh, um, we have a, a Python agent that just sits there and runs and accepts FTP connections, and as soon as a file arrives, so basically in real time, as soon as we get that data from the server, um, we can pass that file, extract the telemetry out of it, um, and then upload that and push it into the pipeline. Um, we're also able to do some um, slightly creative things. We really wanted these to be load balanced because some of these devices will just send you a file and then assume that you've got it even if it failed. Um, so again, losing data is a big issue. So we wanted to have some sort of TCP load balancing. Um, and this is actually theoretically possible and we got some version of it working. Um, if you know about FTP protocol, you'll know that it does not react kindly to load balancing. Um, but it is theoretically possible, and we got it working with Elastic Beanstalk um, and TCP proxying. Um, ask me about that later in the hallway track if you're interested uh, in, in adapting technologies from the 70s. Um, so we had a streaming analytics cluster. The goal, the idea of the streaming analytics cluster was that um, it was going to be this all, like, we knew we wanted some sort of, like, real-time stream processing thing so we could do really complex aggregates of telemetry coming in. And we did a heap of research, weeks of research on and off to, to figure out what the best tool for the job was. And we settled on Apache Flink. Um, and Apache Flink is an amazing piece of technology for real-time stream processing. That's what Alibaba uses to process their real-time sales workflows. Um, it's also a huge industrial piece of machinery um, where really what we needed was a desktop printer. Um, and we had to write in Scala, um, which was disappointing. Um, Apache Flink actually used to have Python bindings, but no longer does. Um, but that is currently performing some reasonably complex validation of telemetry. Um, so we had a vision of using, I'll describe later why we haven't done our analysis in Flink. Um, but um, it currently it's doing a bit of validation. Um, it basically makes sure that everything coming through our stream is correct. Um, and then forwards that into our time series database. Um, what it really does do a good job at, and what would have been a pain to write in Python if we hadn't used it, is essentially buffering, checkpointing, error handling. Like let's say our, our influx DB goes down, um, and we then have to basically spin our wheels while we wait for it to come back up. Or for instance, we want to upload some new telemetry validation rules, um, and we have to somehow take that, that stream processing down, take a save point of where we left off, um, and then deploy the new version and then start from that same save point. Um, Flink does an amazing job of that. So as I said, this is overkill, but the overkill was actually mostly around the DevOps side, as it was about deploying that cluster. Um, we would actually probably still use it because AWS has just announced a new product called Kinesis Streaming Analytics, which is a fully managed Apache Flink service. Um, which is quite cheap and, and easy to use. So we would actually be strongly considered using that again, even though we, we sort of decided not to in the end. So finally, we have our web application. Um, big monolithic Django Celery React. Um, this has Celery workers in the background passing through all the data in the time series database looking for alerts. The alerting rules are set up via a Django admin. Um, it's the absolute core of the system. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's purposefully disconnected from the telemetry collection because we want to be able to basically do our, write our own buggy code. This is where all of our buggy code lives. Um, and we don't want that to have anything to do with the stuff we can get audited on. Um, so yeah, we disconnect that from that telemetry collection process. Um, the most interesting thing about this, I'm just going to focus on this one thing about this because I've only got five minutes left, um, is that this is really strongly powered by pandas and the Python scientific toolkit. So why pandas? If you remember that our reporting requirements don't map directly to raw sensor data, pandas lets us 
transform raw telemetry live on request. So when we, com when we combine pandas with um, a good time series database like InfluxDB, we can easily load huge amounts of data up to about, we've tested up to about 10,000 records in one data frame. Um, you know, we can obviously do much more than that, but maybe not within a web request. Um, we can perform like, a series of complex calculations. We actually have a full taxonomy of different telemetry types that go from your raw telemetry at the bottom all the way up to, to the calculated telemetry several layers on top of that. Um, and we do that by cycling through data frames all the way up. Um, and we can do that incredibly fast with pandas. Um, it doesn't fully solve every problem. Like for instance, that half second telemetry we're getting, we only get actually a few days of data before you run out of your 10,000 points. Um, but we can do additional roll-ups elsewhere in our platform. We can basically pick and choose where we do our, our complex roll-ups. In the case of that half-second telemetry, we actually get the device agents to do it themselves because they get their data in one-minute chunks of half-second values. So they just do that telemetry roll-up themselves, and then we, we, um, our main platform can, can um, continue on. So this approach was probably the biggest single time saver on the project, and it's probably the biggest takeaway is that you can actually do a lot of this calculation live. When you go out and look at IoT platforms um, online and try and find your best practices, you'll get a lot of information about how to perform database roll-ups um, and, and how to set up streaming analytics clusters like Flink. But if you don't ever have to load more than, say, a few days or a few weeks worth of data for a graph, um, then you can get away with just loading that raw stuff in, passing it through some data frames, returning it, and you will get almost all the way there. So I'll quickly cycle through the results. So we have currently have sensors deployed at all of these um, uh, locations. This is the Parkville station, Town Hall station, and Anzac station. Anzac station is one of the residential areas, so we've got lots of apartment buildings. Um, this is our login screen. Um, we have a, a kind of an overview of, of the tunnel um, site, so you can see all of our um, sensor locations through that. That's a bit of an older image, so we've got a, few, a fair a few more sensors there now. Um, the little preview of the telemetry from the device. We can then dig into a device. Um, we can see here we've got a, a noise monitor uh, near one of the apartment buildings. Um, we can see that device there. There are little red lines. We can see that, that our alerting traces, so um, the alerts in the apartment case of apartment blocks, only work within nighttime hours. Um, so you see those alerts are set up um, you know, over, overnight, and um, they change depending on the, on the, on the day of week as well. Um, this is an example of a, a sensor where we're actually doing a, a, a bit of calculation. Um, VC curve classification is what that says on the left-hand uh, axis. Those letters, E, D, C, B, A, and O, P, each correspond to different activities within a hospital um, that can occur safely at that level of vibration. So there's actually a, a calculation based on, velo on um, vibration velocity curves. Um, and E means you can use an electron microscope. OP means that you can conduct operating, uh, op things in an operating theater. Um, we have our alerts. So uh, that's an alerting trace. I see that's been ex exceeded at, at 22 past midnight and then uh, came back at 26 past. Um, we have our dashboards. Um, so you can see we've got our device health monitoring. We know roughly how much data a, can, a device can collect. Um, our alerts, changes of alerts, um, different categories, et cetera, and the resolutions there on the right. So that's our engineers going and saying, okay, we plan to exceed here, or no, there were no CYP works at this time. Uh, our PDF reports, um, Django admin backend, which look familiar. Um, status pages, we have a heartbeat thing, so we can actually always see when our telemetry is, is going, um, uh, is flowing through it's because that heartbeat will say it will stop. Um, we even have some helper pages. So this is our alerting rule page. We have hundreds of different alerting rules set up across for all those different environmental performance requirements. And I think that's my talk. Well, thanks very much. Thank you, Evan. Thank you. And here's your lovely mug. Thank you very much. Can I get everybody to thank Evan again? Cheers. Sure.